Okay, here we go. So let's start the story right now. We've got the Epic of Gilgamesh and our story takes place today in Sumeria, ancient Sumer. Um, in ancient Sumer, there lives a king, a mighty king, a king called Gilgamesh, and he rules over the city um, with great strength and power. Now, we'll go with the traditional version of this story. Gilgamesh is about 12 to 14 feet tall. He is massive. This is no normal human being. No, no, no. Gilgamesh, as you can see here, is cuddling a full-grown lion as if it were a baby. Mm. He also seems to be wearing a very ancient wrist watch, but uh, we'll try and ignore that. I don't know what the uh, ancients were doing there. Now, Gilgamesh is not the kind of king that you would like to be in charge of you. Let's say this, yeah? He's not a good guy, Gilgamesh. He's a bully. He's harsh to his people. He's mean. He goes to war a lot. He makes his... Uh, people pay him lots of money, even if they don't have it. He has very strict laws. He hurts people if they don't do the right thing. And sometimes he just hurts his subjects for fun. He is not a great guy. Mm. He, he sits in his palace telling people to do this and do that. And he's not very popular. The people of Uruk do not like Gilgamesh even though he is the hero of our story. Hmm, strange story already. Now, Gilgamesh is punished for being such a bad king. The gods, they look down on him and they complain and they criticize. Gilgamesh, you see, he is part god. He is not purely man, he's a demigod. So the kings, as we saw from that kings list, if you were with me on uh, Wednesday morning, on Wednesday morning we saw the kings list and those original kings, they, they were god kings. They reigned for thousands of years before they died. Gilgamesh, he's not quite as powerful as those original god kings, but he's still pretty powerful. He has the blood of the gods within him. And, oh, if my mic is lagging, let me just see if I can fix that. That might be better, hopefully. Um, hmm, hopefully it is. So, he's not a good king. The gods, they decide to punish him by sending down to earth a great beast man. Half man, half beast. Um, but this beast man is like a twin to Gilgamesh, but also like a dark reflection. <laughs> uh, the beast man is the same height as Gilgamesh. If you looked at them side by side, you would say they were maybe twins because the gods have made this beast man to look and be the opposite, or at least the counterpart to Gilgamesh. Now, there are some differences with this beast man because of course he is not just man, he is also a beast. And here's a good picture of him. His name is Enkidu. I told you there'd be some good names. Enkidu. Now, Enkidu is like Gilgamesh, but also the opposite of Gilgamesh. Whereas Gilgamesh lives in a great big palace like the one behind me, Enkidu lives in the forest. Um, whereas Gilgamesh is all about rules and laws, Enkidu just runs with the animals. He hunts with them, he drinks in the water holes with them, he's just a great big beastie man. Oh yeah. And he's a bit dangerous because the sheep around the city of Uruk start to disappear. The odd shepherd starts to disappear. And Gilgamesh keeps getting reports into his palace that this horrible beast is out there in the countryside. The evil and vicious Enkidu. Mm. So, um, uh, how tall rock? We're talking, let's say, 14 foot tall. Yeah, let's go for it. Yeah, very, very big. These are ginormous people. Now, as you can see in the picture, Enkidu doesn't look like a human. They say, you know, if you shaved him and took his horns away, he would look just like Gilgamesh. But in our picture here, he has not been shaved and he still has horns and hooves and a lot of fur. Hmm. So he's a great furry, shaggly beast man. Hmm. Now, Gilgamesh, he keeps getting these reports and he decides that he needs to do something about the threat that is Enkidu. He needs to get rid of him somehow. And so he starts to ponder and think, how do I get rid of a horrible beast man 
without having to go through any real effort because I'm a bit of a lazy king. Ah, I know what I'll do. I will tame the beast man. Um, oh, in this picture, he is holding some great big spear of some kind. Yeah, um, I guess. Uh, in the wild, he would not be, he would not be dressed like this. Um, in the stage where we are in the story right now, he would be running around completely naked, except, of course, for his fur, like a, like a bear or something. In this one, he's dressed up. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, very much so. Very much taller than that. Um, so, the uh, King Gilgamesh, he needs to think of a way to tame this beast. He thinks he's not going to be able to kill him. He's too powerful. But he might be able to tame him. Maybe, uh, maybe he needs to set up a trap. And so Gilgamesh, he throws his weight around and he finds himself a beautiful woman in the kingdom. And he tells her, you, go out there into the forest and kiss that beast. Because once you have kissed the beast, he will chill right out. Or something like that. I'm sure the words were more grand in the original. So, off she goes. I'm not sure if she wants to go. It sounds pretty scary. You know, normal average sized woman going off in the forest on her own to meet a beast man who's 14 foot tall with horns. Probably not safe. But she does it anyway because Gilgamesh is a great big bully. And so she goes out into the forest. Oh, oh. And um, can, can everyone give me a, a hint? Is my mic breaking up for everyone or is it just John that's hearing the, the mic break up? It's fine. Okay. Uh, John, it might be a problem on your end. Uh, okay. I, I think I think it's working for others. Yeah, we're all good. Okay. So yeah, John, you might need to have a little fiddle with your... It might be your internet connection's a bit funny. I don't know. Um, sorry. So, okay, kind of. <laughs> all right. Well, hopefully, hopefully it, will, it will keep going. So, uh, Enkidu is out there in the forest living with, you know, the beasts, the animals. He's running around with the wolves and the bears and the lions and all that kind of stuff. Just having a great time being a beast man, I guess. Um, beastie, beastie, beastie. Um, when this beautiful woman, she comes into the forest and she starts hunting him down. Now, I don't fully know how she manages to hunt him down. You know, there is a story behind that, but long story short, she manages to find Enkidu. She manages to sneak up to Enkidu and give him a great big kiss. Now, Enkidu is instantly changed. He, he doesn't change the way he looks. He's still a great big furry shaggly beast man, but he is now, his whole character changes. And the animals, who were his friends, they smell it instantly. When Enkidu stops kissing this woman and he goes off to run with the animals again, they all run away from him. It is a bit like Beauty and the Beast, yes. They, they, they don't like him. He smells wrong. And he feels like he doesn't really fit with the animals anymore. Basically, this woman has ruined his animal nature and has made him far too civilized. Oh no, just by the magic of that kiss. Hmm. So Enkidu is in a bit of a grump, as you can imagine. But the woman, she falls in love with Enkidu, and Enkidu, he falls in love with her. And the two of them decide to settle down and live in a nice little cottage as shepherds, where they will look after sheep, and they have a perfectly nice life for a short amount of time. Because now that Enkidu is civilised, he starts to, he learns to talk, in the human tongue and all this kind of stuff. And he talks to his girlfriend and she tells him lots of stories about the horrible King Gilgamesh and how mean he is and what a terrible beastly king he is. Um, yes, yeah, Enkidu does eat sheep, yes. Um, yeah, He does look a bit like a centaur crossed with a human, doesn't he? Yeah, not the horsey bit, but he's got the, the feet of a horse, I guess. You know, big cloppity hooves, yeah. Uh, it would have had to have been a big cottage rock because, yeah, this guy's big. Bye. So Enkidu, he hears about Gilgamesh and he decides, hang on, this doesn't seem right. There's that beautiful city over there where my beautiful girlfriend comes from and there's a horrible king who does horrible things. I, I think I should go and sort this out. So off he goes to the city in, and he bangs on the doors of the city and he's let through to the throne room behind me here, where Gilgamesh is right in the middle of doing a horrible thing, because that's what Gilgamesh does. 
Um, Gilgamesh ha is basically bullying a newly married couple. They've just become married and he's bullying them and stealing stuff from them and being offensive to them, being really mean. Um, but um, as he's doing this, as he's in full bully mode and the, the poor married couple are really sad, um, along comes Enkidu. He bursts into the palace and he says, leave those poor people alone. That's not fair. Something like that. Um, um, so Gilgamesh, he stops, he looks up from his bullying of that day. You know, he's always doing something wrong as Gilgamesh. And he looks at Enkidu and he says, what's it to you, beast man? What are you doing in my palace? Look at you with your stupid horns and your stupid shaggly hair and your stupid hooves. Who are you to come in here and tell me what to do? I'm the king. Check out my crown. Now, Enkidu is having none of this. He says, I'm a beast man and I've never even lived in a city, but even I can tell that what you are doing is wrong, you great big mean king. And so Gilgamesh does what any self-respecting, selfish, horrible, greedy king would do. He jumps down off of his throne and he starts to fight Enkidu. Doo -doo. Now, there's a great big fight. Enkidu is punching Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh is punching Enkidu. The two of them are rolling around. Now, Gilgamesh says, if you can beat me, if you can beat me in this fight, Enkidu, I will let these people go and I will stop bullying them. But if I beat you, Enkidu, you have to get out of my castle and never, ever come back, you great big beastie man. Hmm. And they keep on fighting. Now, I've already said, Enkidu and Gilgamesh, they're kind of like twins. They're made out of the same kind of godly stuff. Uh, Enkidu's just got more horns, you know? Gilgamesh has got a, maybe a fancier beard. But other than that, they're pretty simple. They're pretty uh, similar. So they're fighting. They're rolling around on the floor. Enkidu's punching Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is punching Enkidu. They fight for about three long hours. Uh, you see the great big pillars behind me. They're smashing each other into those things, knocking each other about. But because they're both huge, superhuman, godly creatures, um, they're not really hurting each other. They're just trying to, you know, one's trying to get the, the, the one up on the other. Now, after three hours, Gilgamesh finally grabs hold of Enkidu, slams him down to the floor, and Enkidu gives in. He has been beaten. Oh, no. Which means, of course, that Gilgamesh can keep on bullying the people, and Enkidu has to go back to the forest and keep away from the city forever. Oh, no. No, they didn't break the palace down, but you'd have thought they would do, wouldn't you? You know, all that smashing about. No, the, the palace was very strong. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yes, I'll put... Uh, Gilgamesh on the screen with Enkidu over here. Now, so that's what should have happened. That was the, the deal that they made whilst fighting. If Enkidu wins, then Gilgamesh stops being a bully. If Gilgamesh wins, he gets to keep being a bully and he sends Enkidu away. But something magical has happened in that three hours. Something, uh, yes, I will be doing that lessons next week. Something magical has been happening in those three hours. These two men, almost like brothers, smacking each other about, and they've fallen deeply in love. Ah, oh. Gilgamesh, he puts his hand out and he picks up Enkidu. Enkidu gives him a great big hug. <laughs> and they say, brothers, yeah, brothers. And Gilgamesh says, Enkidu, I might have won this fight, but you've taught me a lesson. I shouldn't be such a horrible meanie. What I was doing was wrong. I think you've knocked some sense into me. And Enkidu says, Oh, I like you. Shall we live in the palace together and be the best of friends forever? And they say, yes, it did take a strange turn. <laughs> but there you go. They are like reunited twins, separated at birth, and now they will be best friends forever. Now... The two men, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, man, beast man, whatever, they settle down and they live happily in the city for a couple of years. Gilgamesh is taught by Enkidu how to stop being such a bully. Yeah, Enkidu teaches him kindness and compassion and justice. Mm. Uh, whereas Gilgamesh teaches Enkidu things like 
how to wear clothes and uh, how to plait your beard going by this picture and how to live in a civilized way so they're both learning from each other and they become a very good powerful combination because of course you've got these two super humanly strong and powerful beings who are now working together for the good of the people sounds pretty good yeah um but this is an epic story and not all things can last that cannot be the end of the story it would be too boring so after a while gilgamesh starts to get bored you know the years have gone by and he gets tired of his life um as it is and he decides that he wants to go on an adventure now he's heard of this guy over here humbaba let me see if i can bring him down below me there we go so he's heard of humbaba this wicked demon now she he it it's unclear usually seen as a female but not always um humbaba she lives in the forests of lebanon which are quite a long way from uruk uh, we're talking to the west um, you know out towards the red sea there and he's heard tale of humbaba this demon she lives in the forest and every time people try and go into her forest she just eats them she gobbles them up yeah it does look like groot yeah um she's a, a nature spirit you could say and as you can see here this is an original an ancient sumerian image of her and this is a more modern representation so that we can kind of imagine what she might look like but if you're going to draw humbaba you could draw them uh, however you like really as long as there's lots of leafy bits i think you you're all right so humbaba this demon she's a real problem to anyone who wants to enter the forest she absolutely loves the forest she loves the trees and she will protect them viciously from anyone now she never comes out of the forest she's never like you know stomping around cities eating people no 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 she just likes her forest and she wants it left alone and she won't let people in but gilgamesh decides that he needs to make this forest safe for the people and he needs to go there and he needs to kill humbaba now at first uh enkidu says no no we should do this this is wrong uh no she's just protecting our forest and besides it's really dangerous she's really big and she's got big claws and she can shoot lasers out of her eyes and i don't like that i don't, I don't like lasers it would catch my fur on fire and i'll be all, all fiery I'll be all... but anyway gilgamesh says no enkidu come on have a sense of adventure come on dude we're two superhuman big guys we're brothers now let's go and fight this demon and make the world a safer place oh yeah now enkidu finally agrees to this and the two of them set off on their journey to lebanon off to the cedar forests um to go and defeat the demon now as they're walking along it takes them a few days it would take normal people more than a few days these two just a few days because you know they're big giant people they're stomping around they can move pretty fast they don't need as much uh, sleep as normal people but they do need to rest every now and again so every every other night or so they lie down in a fo in a forest somewhere or a, i don't know in a sand dune depending whether they're going over the desert i guess and they have a nice sleep now one night gilgamesh is asleep and he has a dream ah oh, it's a weird dream in which he looks at enkidu and enkidu is there in his dream completely still as if he is asleep and in the dream gilgamesh tries to wake up enkidu but he won't wake up oh now gilgamesh wakes up the next morning he says enkidu enkidu i had this terrible dream i had a dream that you were dead enkidu says oh what does it look like gilgamesh says i saw you you were asleep you won't wake up i think you were dead enkidu says hmm no it probably means that we're going to be so good at fighting the demon that we're going to have a really good sleep after you know it's going to be fine don't worry about it um gilgamesh says uh oh, okay okay that well, sounds all right they travel on some more a couple of nights later they have another sleep um and uh gilgamesh sleeps again and he dreams again in this dream he sees himself caught in a massive great big stone fist and he cannot get out he's trapped he's trapped and he wakes up in a sweat 
and he says to, to Enkidu, he says, Enkidu, I had a dream. I was caught in a great big stone hand. And Enkidu says, oh, oh yeah, yeah, all right. That probably means that we are going to be victorious and have fists like rocks because we're so great. Yeah, that's definitely what that means. So Gilgamesh is happy and they carry on. Now, eventually, um, eventually, Gilgamesh and Enkidu, they arrive at the great forest, the cedar forest of Lebanon. Um, what happened to the woman? Good question. Uh, she's at home uh, knitting a Enkidu fur scarf. Mm -hmm. That's what she's doing, in my version at least. Now, they get into the forest and Gilgamesh, he's impatient. He's a kind of, I want to get doing stuff kind of guy. He doesn't want to just wait around. So he thinks, how are we going to get uh, Humbaba to come to us so that we can kill her? I know, we'll start chopping down trees. So him and, and Enkidu, they take massive axes and they just start smashing trees down. Some big, fine old trees, just destroying everything. And of course, the sound of the trees falling to the ground and the animals running away and the leaves rustling, it all gets back to Humbaba and she comes storming out of the center of the forest in a great big rage. And she tries to fight Enkidu and Gilgamesh. Now, on their own, Either en Enkidu or Gilgamesh probably could not beat Humbaba. She is a force of nature, most literally, and they, cannot, they could not stop her. Her laser eyes are shooting in all directions. Her great big stompy clippity cloppity feet are stomping clippity cloppity hing. Her claws are sharp and raking through the air, trying to get at these two guys. But together, they manage to bring her down. Finally, Gilgamesh jumps on top of her and chops her head off. Oh, the whole forest weeps because these two people have now destroyed the spirit that protected it. And they've chopped down a whole load of, um, uh, chopped down a whole load of trees and the forest is sad, but they're not going to stop there. Oh, um, I've, uh, can I put all three on the same page? Let me see if I can do that. That's a good one. Let's see if I can find Unfortunately, there's going to be more, I'm afraid. You might have to watch back later and find the, other, the others. But there you are. They are. They're on there for now, at least. There's Gilgamesh, Enkidu, and Humbaba. Is this a true story, Tommy? Oh, it depends. I mean, it's a very old story. In fact, this is the oldest story in history. At least 4,200 years old since it was first written down. It's the oldest story we have. Um, it was probably told long before that. And as you'll see as we get to the end, you'll, you'll, know, you'll realize just how old it is. But um, some people, of course, they would say it was true. Other people say you don't get beastie men and you don't get 12, uh, 14 foot tall kings and you don't get forest spirits. But it might just be that we did used to get those things, but they're all gone now because this story is so old. So... I'll let you make up your own mind, I guess. And of course, even if it's not literally well, real, this story tells us a lot about what it is to be a human. So in many senses, it is definitely real, even if it's not literally true. Yeah, who needs to care about the details? Hmm. So, in a little victory dance now, Gilgamesh, he starts doing his victory dance. Oh yeah, happy dance, happy dance. He's killed the demon, he's killed the demon. And... Out of you know pure happiness, he decides to go to the center of the forest where Humbaba lives and chop down the biggest, greatest, grandest tree in the forest um, as a kind of you know keepsake, a souvenir of we came here, we killed the demon, now we're good. Um, now they chop down loads of other trees, hundreds more, and they make a raft. They then put the biggest tree of the forest onto the raft and they sail home down the river back to Uruk. And um, when they get there, they take the biggest, boldest tree in the forest and they make it into the grand great uh, gate sorry, of the city of Uruk so that all will remember how they defeated Humbaba and took down the largest tree in the forest deforestation indeed Riley yeah I, I, I do not support uh, the actions of Gilgamesh and Enkidu at this time and it must be said nor do the gods the gods are not happy at all Anu and um, Ishtar and uh, all the others you know, Nurgle probably they're not happy they're really really cross and they decide that Gilgamesh and Enkidu 
must suffer. One of these two must die. And so the gods, they gather round in a great solemn circle and they discuss what they should do. And they decide, of course, that the one who must die is Enkidu. So as they get back to the city and as the gates are being made, Enkidu suddenly falls to his knees, weak and out of breath. And he collapses on the floor and Gilgamesh picks his brother up and he takes him to the palace and he gets the best physicians and doctors in the whole kingdom together to try and fix Enkidu, but he cannot be saved. And after three days of lying, sad and muttering about dark shadowy corridors, Enkidu finally dies. Now Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh is not happy, here we are. Here he is with his dead friend, Enkidu. He doesn't know what to do with himself. His best friend in all the world is dead. So Gilgamesh does what is traditional in Samaria, and he takes off his clothes, and he wears the clothes of animals instead to show his grief. And he cries, and he weeps, and he shouts at the sky and the gods, and he swears a solemn oath, because not only is his friend dead, but this is the first time that Gilgamesh has ever realized that one day he's going to die too. And he's not having it. He swears and he tells the gods that he will never die. He will live forever. They can take away his friend, but they cannot take away him. Hmm, yeah, there's, a, there's a definitely a Hagrid vibe going on there with Enkidu. And so Gilgamesh, in his clothes of animal skins... He just stomps out of the city, away into the wilderness, to try and find the key to living forever. Now, he wanders far and wide, and he asks all the wise people he can find, how do I live forever? Who do I go to to live forever? What do I need to live forever? I am not going to die. I am too sad. And he finally hears a rumor, a whisper, that there at the end of the world, is a special man, a man who does not die. His name, Utnapishtim, another amazing name. Utnapishtim, at the end of the world, that's where you need to go, Gilgamesh. And to get there, you just need to walk through a mountain and cross a deadly river. But if you can do that, and you can get to Utnapishtim, then maybe, just maybe, he will help you live forever. So, Gilgamesh is a hero. You know, he's massive, he's 14 foot tall. He's not afraid of anything. He's killed a demon. He's going off on his journey. And he stomps off to the north, all on his own, no friends, still probably crying most of the time because he just can't stand it to be without his brother Enkidu. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> oh, I almost teared up myself then. <coughs> Now, he comes to the mountain that he needs to travel through. But there is a problem, as we can see here in this picture. Now, this picture may, might look ancient, but it's not. This is a modern version of an ancient picture. So this isn't necessarily from the original. But uh, the story is the same. Um, he comes across, he comes to this mountain. Now, this mountain has a huge tunnel going through it. A dark, scary tunnel. And this tunnel uh, is guarded by these two ginormous creatures. Uh, no, I'm not crying. I'm, I'm just uh, <coughs> choking on my uh, my own throat. So, you know, dry throat syndrome. Um, so, Gilgamesh, he comes to the mountain. It's guarded by these two ginormous talking scorpions. Because why not? This is a myth. We'll have talking scorpions. And the talking scorpions, they guard the gate. And their job is simple. Do not let people through. People are not allowed through the mountain. One job. Don't let people through. Doesn't matter who you are. You're not coming through. And so Gilgamesh, he comes to the gates and he says, let me through. And the scorpions say, no, we're not going to let you through. We are guardian scorpions. That's kind of our thing. And Gilgamesh says, don't you know who I am? I am the king. I'm King Gilgamesh. And besides, I'm far too sad to be putting up with your nonsense today. 
and the scorpions say, no, no, I'm not going to let you through. No, no, I'm not doing it. Look, we got big clippity clippity claws. We got big poisonous stingers. We're not letting you through. They say, why do you want to come through anyway? Nobody ever wants to come through. It's a big, stark, dark, stinky tunnel. Nobody wants to go through there. And Gilgamesh says, well, I'm King Gilgamesh, and I'm going to go through the mountain, and I'm going to meet Utnapishtim, and I'm going to live forever. And the scorpions, they look at each other. They look at Gilgamesh, all bedraggled in his rags and his animal skins, and they just burst out laughing. They just giggle all over the place and they're laughing so hard that Gilgamesh just opens up the gates and runs on through and they're laughing too hard to stop him. So in he goes to the tunnel. Now, this tunnel is not a normal tunnel. This is not a well-lit, beautifully illuminated tunnel. Oh, no, 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 no. This tunnel is dark and this tunnel has a condition to it. If you go into this tunnel, you have to come out the other end within 12 days. If you do not come out at the end within 12 days, by the time the sun rises on that 12 days, you will be lost and you will be stuck in that dark tunnel forever. Hmm? So if you're going to step in, you better get your wiggle on because hmm, you can't hang about. Now, Gilgamesh, as we've said, he can walk a long way and He's very, very big and he's very, very tough. And yeah, so he enters the tunnel and he starts to march. He just pushes himself right on through. He keeps on walking. Now, the original poem here, it gets very repetitive. So I'll, I'll try and uh, uh, give you an, an example of that. But the poem says that he walks through the tunnel and he cannot see his hands in front of his face and it is dark and it is scary. And he walks for another day and he cannot see his hand in front of his face and it is dark and it is scary. And he walks for another day and he cannot see the hand in front of his face and it is dark and it is scary. And then he keeps on walking as he walks for another day he cannot see the hand in front of his face and it is dark and scary and so on and so on until he loses all track of time completely all there is now is darkness and his sadness and the march forward he has no idea whether it's day or night whether it's tuesday or wednesday he just keeps on moving now the tunnel must be very very long uh, rock because this is Gilgamesh we're talking about I suspect the tunnel is not quite natural but hmm, who knows now he doesn't stop not for a moment he never rests he just keeps walking with his great big demigod like feet and he comes out of the tunnel just as the sun is rising on that 12th day and he steps from the pure black darkness into wonderful golden light and he looks out ahead of him and there is a beautiful green spreading pasture with flowers and little rabbits and like an Easter card or whatever. And there behind, beyond that, there's a great wide flowing river which he has to cross. And behind that river he knows Utnapishtim, the man at the end of the world, the man who can help him live forever. Mm. There is also something else that he sees, though, not just um, this wide, beautiful Easter scene. No, no, no. There's also a humongous stone giant. The stone giant is stomping around down there. And now if there's one thing that Gilgamesh can do that he's very good at, it's fighting monsters. You know, that's like his thing. You know, well, maybe being a bully and then fighting monsters. Maybe those are his things. Or in recent times since the death of Enkidu, maybe crying and fighting monsters. Maybe those are his things. But definitely one of his things is fighting monsters. And so he goes into full on battle mode. He rushes down the hill. He jumps on the great big giant and he starts punching it and hacking at it. Um, now, the giant does grab hold of him, capturing Gilgamesh in his hand, but Gilgamesh struggles and strains, just like in the dream, and he smashes apart the giant's hand, he jumps on a giant's head, he rams his axe into the giant's uh, skull, and eventually the whole thing crumbles into just a great big stack of rocks. Oh yeah. Now, Gilgamesh does his victory dance again. Oh yeah, oh yeah, 
killed a monster, another monster. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Now, um, uh, the it is like the Moana monster, isn't it? Yeah, the, the, the volcano guys. Um, guys, if we are going to put stuff in the chat, can we keep it to real words, please? Because otherwise I just lose track of it. I, ca I can only see a few comments at a time. And if they're just lots of random letters, that doesn't really help me out. So thank you. Um, now, the monster is dead. Uh, Gilgamesh is doing his victory dance. He's in full victory dance mode. He's, he's in a good mood because he got through the very scary mountain, of course. But it's at this point that he feels a tap on his shoulder. He looks around and there's an old man. The old man is not very happy. Now, his name is Urshanabi. And he says, excuse me, um, but what do you think you are doing? And Gilgamesh says, ha, don't worry, old man. Just killed myself a monster. You can thank me later. <laughs> you want to join my victory dance? And Ushinabi says, no, no, I don't. You're a complete idiot. What do you, who do you think you are just going around killing monsters like that? I mean, what, what are you even here for anyway? And Gilgamesh says, well, I'm here to cross the river and go and meet Ush, uh, Utnapishtim at the end of the world so I can live forever. And Ushinabi says, oh, yeah, great idea. What a great idea. Yes, yeah, cross the river, he says. Cross the river. I could help you cross the river. All I need is my stone giant, isn't it? To push my boat across the river. This river that is so dangerously poisonous that it melts anything it touches, except for my mate, the stone giant, who you seem to be dancing up and down on the dead body of. Oh, you're an idiot, he says. Now, Gilgamesh feels bad because now he's just destroyed his only way across the river. You know, what a pro. But U Oceanabi... He sees that Gilgamesh is a wise, noble soul and also a very, very sad soul. And he says, all right then. Well, if you can go and get me 300 oars, we could, I could probably manage to row you across the river, but I'm going to need 300 because it takes 150 strokes to get across that river. And each time I put an oar in the river, it's going to melt to nothing because I told you it's like full of really strong acid or something. I don't know if they knew about acid back then, but you get the picture. So... Gilgamesh, he takes his axe, he goes to the nearby woods, and he chops down 300 trees, just like that. It only takes him a day. He's just chopping away like a mad thing, turning them into oars, and he comes back to Ushanabi, who is still sort of, you know, pondering about how he's going to fix that stone giant of his. And he presents Ushanabi with the 300 oars, and Ushanabi is true to his word, and he takes him across the river. Each stroke of those oars... He has to drop the oars in the river as they melt, pick up new ones, stroke again to get across that river. Now, as he is ferrying Gilgamesh across the river, Urshanabi tells Gilgamesh a little bit about Utnapishtim. Um, oh, Rock, I don't know if the stone giant has a name. If he does, I don't know it. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so uh, he's telling them, He's telling Gilgamesh, Urshanabi is, about Utnapishtim and his backstory, basically. Now, Utnapishtim is a very, very old man. He lives forever. In fact, he's got a small family with him. He's got a wife and a daughter, and they, they live forever, too. Um, the reason they live forever is because a long time ago, before the kingdoms of Sumer or any other kingdoms, um, in the time of that first king's list that we looked at on Wednesday, when the, when the kings lived for a long, long time, um, the gods were unhappy with the people. The people who lived on earth were bad people in the eyes of the gods. And so the gods decided to punish the humans by sending a massive flood and killing all of them. Every last one. Get rid. Wipe the slate clean. Start again, maybe. Mm. Now, Anu is the man, is the god who is sending the flood. And he tells all the other gods that he's going to flood the earth, he's going to kill all the humans, and they are not allowed to tell a single human soul. That's the rule. Hmm. Now, the gods agree to this, but the gods aren't happy about this. No, 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 no. And Enki, in particular, that mischievous river god, he's not happy at all. He does not like the idea of all the humans going because he quite likes the humans, to be honest. And so he thinks of a way to get round Anu's order. He's not allowed to tell any humans that there's going to be a flood. But he particularly likes this guy, Urshanabi. So he comes up with a plan. 
he comes down to earth, does Enki, and he sits, he stands in front of Urshanabi's house. Now, Urshanabi is inside the house, but Enki does not look at him. He does not greet him. He stands there and he talks to the walls of the house. He says, oh, walls of the house, I have important news. There's a great big flood coming. Oh, if I were you, walls of the house, I would build myself a boat, a really big one. I'd put my family on it and loads of animals just, just for good safety. And then I would be safe in the flood that is definitely coming. Oh, walls of the house. Hmm. So he hasn't told a human soul. He's just told the walls of a house. But of course, Utnapishtim is inside the house and he hears what uh, the god is saying. And so he comes out, he breaks his house to bits, uh, plus a load of other stuff, I imagine, and he builds himself a great big boat. We could even call it an ark. <laughs> yes, Jack. Now, bearing in mind that this story was written many, many years before uh, the Bible story was ever written down. Um, you know, Utnapishtim can be seen as the, the, the original Noah or the proto-Noah or whatever, yeah, in terms of storytelling. Um, very similar. Um, many, many cultures across the world uh, believe that there was a great big flood at some point. We see it, we see it from China to you know, Mesopotamia. Um, so, you know, maybe there's some truth to it. Maybe not. Maybe just good stories don't die. Yeah, and people like to uh, change and adapt and use old stories. Or, or maybe there's a grain of truth in it. I'll let you decide. So, Utnapishtim, he builds his, his ark, his boat, and he is safe from the great flood. Um, and once the floods go away and all the humans are dead, Anu looks down and he sees, hang on, there's some guys still alive. I was trying to kill them all. What's this dude doing? I was going to make a whole race of new humans and they were going to be the good guys. And now we've got this old dudes hanging around from the old lot. And he's probably just going to turn all the rest bad because those humans were rubbish. So, um. What he does uh, is he takes Utnapishtim and he says, Utnapishtim, I will now make it so that you live forever. Um, now, why did the boat not burn from the acid? It's magic. Okay. It's a magic boat, just like the stone giant was magic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just magic. Um, uh, Anu takes Utnapishtim and he says, right, you are now going to live forever because you managed to cheat the system. You managed to survive the flood. So I think you deserve a reward. So you and your family, you can live forever, but you're going to have to stay at the end of the world away from the new humans. So you get to live forever, but you can't leave your home, basically. You know, it's a bit of a trade-off there. So Utnapishtim is quite happily living at the end of the, of the world in a nice house with his family, um, just chilling out for the rest of all time, I imagine. He doesn't get many visitors, let's put it that way. So he's quite surprised when Gilgamesh comes stomping up to his house. Here's Utnapishtim, that's how you spell Utnapishtim right there. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yes, this is like he's in quarantine. Um, so Utnapishtim is very surprised when Gilgamesh and Urshanabi stomp up to his house. Um, at first, Utnapishtim is very angry at Urshanabi because Urshanabi's job is to ferry people across the river, but not without permission from Utnapishtim, yeah? And usually he brings that cool stone giant with him and where's the stone giant? He's not happy. Um, and then he's confused by Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh says, please, you've got to help me. I need to live forever. I do not want to die. And Utnapishtim looks at him and he sees that Gilgamesh is so, so sad, but there's nothing he can do about it. Utnapishtim may live forever himself, but he doesn't have the power to make, to give that gift to other people. And he says, I'm really sorry, dude, but no, you're going to have to die like everyone else. Um, and Gilgamesh just breaks down into tears because, you know, this is, you know, he's, he's gone through a lot of effort to get here. He's just walked for 12 days solid, chopped down 300 trees, crossed a river that, you know, can melt you like a piece of butter and he's finally got to where he needs to be and he's being told that there's no way forward now life is life so Gilgamesh he breaks down into tears and Utnapishtim says okay look but maybe this will work the gods they gave me immortality because they were impressed by me so maybe if you can show them that you can that you are impressive they will give you eternal life as well maybe if you can show them that you can stay awake for seven days without any sleep, then you would show them that you can conquer sleep. And that means that they will uh, probably know that you can handle immortality. Yeah, that's his plan. 
Gilgamesh says, no problem. I've just walked for 12 days solid without sleep anyway and chopped down 300 trees and crossed the river. I'll stay awake for seven days. And he falls directly straight asleep. Yeah. He had to stay awake for seven days. He managed roughly 3.6 seconds. Okay. He's asleep on the floor. Now, Utnapishtim and his family and Urshanabi, they grab hold of Gilgamesh and they drag him into the house and put him on a, you know, a nice soft space. And there Gilgamesh sleeps, snoring like a boar. Uh, and every day, Utnapishtim sends, uh, gets his daughter to bake a, a nice fresh loaf of bread to give that, put it next to Gilgamesh so that Gilgamesh will smell the bread and wake up and he'll have something to eat when he wakes up. But Gilgamesh stays asleep. He stays asleep for seven days. Every day, the new loaf of bread gets put next to him and he's not eating it because he's asleep. Now, on the seventh day, Gilgamesh, he wakes up, he gives a big yawn and he says, right, yeah, Utnapishtim, sorry about that. Just drift, drifted off for just a moment there. I'm with you now. Let's do the staying awake for seven days thing. And Utnapishtim says, nah, you, sorry, you fell straight asleep and you've been asleep for a week so i don't think you're quite ready for this gilgamesh says what do you mean i've been asleep for a week i haven't it's just i closed my eyes for a second i had a little yawn i'm, I'm fine i'm ready to go now come on it to let's do this thing let's uh let's, let's just dance for seven days let's dance let's dance yeah i'm full of energy i'm surprisingly full of energy really considering what i've been through and it says dude just, just slow down no Look, look at the bread next to you. I've been giving you a different loaf of bread every day. And he looks at today's bread. It's nice and fresh. He looks at the day before. It's a bit stale. He looks at day one's bread. It's all like green and moldy and disgusting. Oh, says Gilgamesh. I have been asleep for a week, haven't I? Uh, okay. Oh, dear. And then it hits him that he's never going to get to be immortal. He's never going to get to live forever. And he's super sad. Again. He's good at being sad. <laughs> uh, bread in a time before preservatives definitely expires that quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's no, there's no healthy preservatives put in that bread to, in these days. No, no, no. So, um, Gilgamesh then, he's incredibly sad, and Utnapishtim cannot stand to see him this sad. So he te- he says, okay, I cannot let you live forever. I, I don't have that power in me, and I don't think the gods are going to do it now either because you did that whole falling asleep for a week thing. So I do know of a very magical special plant. Um, Oh yes, I'll see if I can bring the stone giant back over here. Um, I do know of a very special magical plant that if you eat it, it doesn't let you live forever, but it does reset you, so to speak. It brings you back to being a child. It it gives you youth again. So Gilgamesh says, right, okay, I'll go and get that plant. Where is it? Utnapishtim says, oh, it's easy. It's just at the bottom of the ocean. You just got to go down into the ocean and get it and eat it and you'll be fine. So, okay, this is Gilgamesh. I guess I've been through enough already. One more bit of ocean, not too bad. Um, and as they're getting ready to leave back across the water with their 150 oars that are remaining, um, Utnapishtim says, you, Urshanabi, because you lost that giant, because you brought this strange sleepy man to my house, you're sacked. You don't get to be my boatman anymore. Go, go away. Go get a different job. And so Utnapishtim, who is very sad at first, teams up with Gilgamesh. And together, they decide that they're going to go get that plant. Da, da, da. So, new team. Gilgamesh and, Utnip- and uh, Urshanabi. That's our new team. And off they go. Now, at first, they go back to the city of Uruk. And they get a few friends together. And they grab themselves a boat. And they push that boat out and they sail it with the help of um, Urshanabi, because he does boats quite well. They sail it out into the sea. When they find the right spot, and I'm not entirely sure uh, what the right spot is. Uh, Jack, the picture of the giant does have um, lava in it, but that doesn't you know, mean that the real dude did. I just found that. I just typed in stone giant into Google and that's what I got. So I don't know exactly if the if the original stone giant from the story did have lava. It's not mentioned, so I assume he's just a boat load of rocks, really. Um, is the other dude still, uh, still alive now? Oh, what? Uh, Utnapishtim. Yeah, Utnapishtim will live forever. Um, Urshanabi is with Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh is, is out there. They're out on a boat. And they find the right spot in the ocean. I don't know how, but they do. And uh, they stop the boat. We can see in this little picture here, there's the boat in the background. And... Uh, at that point, Gilgamesh says, right, 
We're going to tie some great big bits of bronze to my feet so that I'm super heavy. Oh, is he alive now? Uh, yes, I suppose he would be alive now if you believe that kind of thing. Yes, Utnapishtim would still be alive uh, because he lives forever. He's probably sat there at the end of the world making bread. Maybe every now and again he goes through the, t through the tunnel and talks to the scorpions. I don't know. Um, but Gilgamesh, he gets big bits of bronze tied to his feet. He has a rope tied around his waist and his friends, they chuck him into the sea. And of course, because of the bits of bronze, he sinks right down to the bottom. Now, he's a big dude, is Gilgamesh. He's got big, powerful lungs. And so he takes a big breath before he goes down and he holds that breath as he falls to the bottom of the ocean and he looks around and sure enough, there it is. The plant that Utnapishtim described to him is right there on the bottom of the ocean. He picks it and he tugs on the rope a few times and his friends, they hurl the rope in. It's very hard, difficult because Gilgamesh is a big lad and they hurl and they pull and they bring him up back up to the boat. There he is wet and sopping with the flower in his hand, the plant. Now, Gilgamesh has learnt his lesson. Oh, yes. Um, he's not going to be so hasty. Yeah, he was a bit too hasty in some of those adventures. Maybe he shouldn't have killed Humbaba because that led to his friend dying. Maybe he shouldn't have killed the giant because that led to, to uh, him you know, not being able to get the, across the river so easily. So he decides, look, I'm going to be careful. I'm not just going to eat this straight away. Um, as far as I know, the scorpions did not get punished. Um, as far as I know. Yeah. And maybe there's a sequel somewhere hidden under the sand of Sumer, which we haven't found yet, which is all about the scorpions, but maybe not. So he's, he's not going to eat the plant first. No, no, no. It could be a trick. It could be a lie. It could be the wrong plant. So he decides what he's going to do. He's going to take this plant back to the city, back to Uruk, and he's going to give it to the oldest man he can find, the oldest man in the city. And if the old man gets young then he knows that the plant is legitimate uh, and he'll eat the rest um but if he if the old man like falls over dead or it just doesn't work then he can just throw the plant away yeah he's not going to be quite so um uh fast about it uh ah is this the same picture as in the book oh that's good oh, that's cool um uh no, they definitely don't know about that and even if they were they wouldn't be worried because he lives forever so you know immortality that's the thing um, so the plant, um, he takes it along and he stomps back with his friends, including Ushinabi. They stomp back to the city in pretty good moods because, you know, they're, they're thinking that this is going to work out. You know, Gilgamesh is at least going to be young again. Yeah. Um, now, on the way there, they're nearly back to the city and it's a very hot, dry day because it's a very hot, dry part of the world most of the time. And they're walking past a beautiful, clear pool a lake uh beautiful clear water nice and relaxing it looks and, and just perfect so gilgamesh um he stuffs the plant in his pocket he takes off all his clothes he puts them by the side of the river and he die or the lake sorry he dives in and starts having a nice cooling relaxing wash you know just the thing he needs walking through all that dust and haze and just the thing he needs before getting home to eat the flower and become young again now, as he's there, just chilling in the water, his pocket is left unguarded, and along comes a snake, just a little, a little snake, and it sniffs with its tongue, I guess, <laughs> and it smells the wonderful plant, and it goes into his pocket, and it eats it every single bit. Now, the snake instantly transforms into a young snake again. In fact, it kicks off its skin, its old skin, leaving a new fresh skin behind, and it slithers off into the undergrowth to go and live another snaky life, I guess. Now, Gilgamesh, he comes back to his clothes. He picks up his clothes. He pats his pocket, and he realizes it's gone, and there on the floor is a snake skin. And, well, I told you, Gilgamesh is good at being sad. Now he's sad again. He knows it's all lost. He knows there's no more plants. He knows that he can't live forever. And he's beside himself with grief. He think, all he can think about is Enkidu lying there dead. <laughs> and so he stomps off back to the city with his friends in a very sad mood. But the story doesn't quite end there. No, no, no. 
this story, which was written 2,400 years ago, has Gilgamesh come to the city of Uruk, and he looks up at those beautiful walls that he built, or at least helped to build, and he sees the amazing gate that he made out of Humbaba's tree that he and his brother Enkidu built together. And he falls to his knees and he starts to cry again because he realizes all of a sudden that, okay, he is going to die, but his city won't die. His doors, his gates won't die. They will live on forever and people will always remember him and Enkidu. And the story ends with Gilgamesh writing on a piece of stone the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And this story, as I say, is at least 4,200 uh, years old. Um, and spookily, the start of that story, the first lines are, once a long, long time ago, yeah? So if it's 4,000 years old and they're saying it was a long time ago, well... It must be a very old story indeed. And in some ways, of course, Gilgamesh was right. He did live forever because, well, I'm telling you about him now. <laughs> there you go. That's the story of Gilgamesh <gasps> exactly on time. Um, it was lovely to have you all here again. I will see you on Monday for some uh, more modern history. And ah, thank you very much. That's very kind, Amani. Kind of and I will see you all soon, hopefully. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. And uh, yeah, try not to beat up demons just for the sake of it yeah just think of the consequences of your actions maybe that's the moral <laughs>